Hi, um, I'm Mark Wasuda. I'm moderating the second panel. I'd also like to thank Leah for inviting me to do this and for organizing this great event. The session is titled Datascapes, Systems, and Representation. Um, each one of these terms, data, systems, representation, are all words that we might want to think about and um, we should think about, which I suppose is the purpose of this panel. Um, at the very least, the panel will be concerned with what representation means in the context of big social data. Of course, it might mean simply how data is visualized and communicated and the different inflections, rhetorical deployments, directions, instrumentalizations, and audiences for this visualization. Yet the, the terms in the panel clearly calls up the issue of data and its intersection with political representation and who is represented or not represented and toward what ends and the degree to which these representations and these absences are made visible and knowable or repressed by the authority of data. And it may also contend with a more indirect but pervasive system of representation, which is how through data sensing, extraction, compilation, and their impact on cities, our contemporary urban imaginaries are transformed and aligned with the expectation that our participation in cities is both the product of data and the producer of data. In this sense, political representation folds into the construction of us and other urban residents as data subjects. Our first speaker is Taylor Shelton, and some of his recent work, such as the essay, which I will uh, give you the title of, Actually Existing Smart Citizens, Expertise and Non-Participation in the Making of Smart Cities, confronts directly the question and problems of what he calls smart citizens. In other papers, this problem of smart subjectivity informs his reading of what he calls the general citizen and the absent citizen. I'm not sure today he's going to uh, speak about that directly, um, but just to give you a bit more background information on his work, Taylor is an assistant professor in the Department of Geosciences at Mississippi State. He's trained as a human geographer. His work combines critical socio-spatial theory and GIS in order to understand, and importantly, to challenge uh, urban inequalities. Um, thank you, Taylor. Thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you, Leah, for organizing. Thank you for, to Lila, wherever you went. Um, and also to Lucy, I don't know if you're here, but for all of the work on getting our act together and, and making this happen. Um, I'm really appreciative. And thanks to all of you all for being here. Um, so I'm going to try my hand at a little bit of a provocation uh, of kind of where I see things uh, being at now and, and also what I think maybe we should be doing. Um, so we'll see how that goes. So as people interested uh, in cities and data and mapping and technology, uh, I see us being confronted with two more or less equally prominent but kind of oppositional trends today. So on the one hand, we have the proliferation of new forms of big, open, and user-generated data that offer tantalizing new possibilities for urban and social scientific analysis. But on the other hand, uh, at the same time as we're witnessing this explosion in new kinds of data, the, there's a pervasive sense that facts just don't matter anymore. Right? Instead, we've entered a post-truth age where blind faith, conviction that one is right, and the ability to yell just a little bit louder than your opponents is tantamount. This condition has become so evident that on the heels of Brexit and the election of Donald Trump, post-truth was named the Oxford Dictionary's 2016 word of the year. But I would say that seeing the last few years as a radical break from that which came before uh, also poses some dangers for us in conceptualizing the role of data in our world. As Jasanoff and Simmet argue in a recent issue of Social Studies of Science, that post-prefix and post-truth is decidedly ahistorical, and that it assumes we were ever in an era to begin with where objective truths reigned supreme and data was all you needed to prove a point. Indeed, tucked away in the geographer David Harvey's uh, classic 1973, Social Justice in the City, is this passage, one of my very favorites uh, ever, which points to the earlier origins of this more ambivalent relationship we have with data. 
Here, Harvey lambasts the geographers of the mid-20th century for what he called their counter-revolutionary tendency to map even more evidence of man's patent inhumanity to man, as it allows the bleeding heart liberal in us to pretend we are contributing to a solution when in fact we are not. As he says, there's already enough information in congressional reports, newspapers, books, articles, and so on to provide us with all of the evidence we need that inequality does indeed exist. For Harvey, this retreat into uh, empiricism and what he calls moral masturbation ultimately serves merely to expiate our guilt without our ever being forced to face the fundamental issues, let alone do anything about them. All of that is to say that this focus on data has long served not just as a means to uncover truths about the world, but also to avoid them. And even though we've devoted massive amounts of time to collecting and analyzing data, uh, in order to better understand society, we also fail to really grapple with the realities of inequality, and especially that part where we actually try to do something to solve them. Instead, we've put so much effort into collecting data and making maps in an effort to prove these realities to be true, uh, all the while such an exercise ends up becoming an excuse to avoid action rather than to take it. And so while the challenge that Harvey poses is a pointed one and one, I think that uh, remains relevant to us today, um, some 45 plus years or so later. I think that the particularities of these two competing social trends that I described means that we don't yet need to give up on data and on mapping as an important tool in the broader project of building a more just and equitable society. But what I think it does do is it offers us an opportunity to rethink precisely what it is that makes mapping critical um, how we can do critical mapping, how we can use mapping and data to advance uh, this goal of building a more just and equitable world. So the argument I want to make the, with the rest of my time is twofold. So first, um, I want to make this kind of argument about where I think we stand now, which is that I think most examples of doing this kind of critical mapping work fall into one of two camps with very different uh, kind of motivations, uh, goals, and ultimately manifestations. Um, so I kind of see this ultimately as these two groups drawing motivation or inspiration, maybe even unintentionally, from either uh, Donna Haraway's invocation of and desire to overturn or counteract what she calls the God trick, or the ability to see everything from nowhere uh, in the spirit of objectivity that we commonly associate with the use of mapping and quantitative data, or alternately in the geographer Elvin Wiley's notion of a strategic positivism, which emphasizes the need to leverage the power of this purported objectivity uh, in order to advance this cause of social and spatial justice as I've described. But beyond just kind of tacking these two theoretical uh, motivations onto all of this existing work in critical mapping, uh, the second thing I wanna do is I wanna argue that in order to better understand these, uh, or that rather that better understanding these uh, different visions of critical mapping allows us to put them into conversation with one another and ultimately develop a maybe more unified praxis of critical mapping. Um, so first I'll, I'll dig a little bit more into this stuff and, and why I think it matters, what it looks like in practice, and then I'll maybe get to the, the second point there at the end. So to start with Elvin Wiley, uh, for him strategic positivism is a way of avoiding both the universalizing and decontextualized epistemological truth claims advocated by hardcore positivists of the mid 20th century, as well as the oppositional universality of anti-foundational thought, just to make sure everybody gets their dose of social theory this morning. Um, but as Wiley argues further, these more ostensibly scientific methodologies of data and mapping have a distinct role to play in advocating for social change, countering what he calls the ideological facts performed by a powerful right-wing governmentality machine. So contra that enormous body of postmodern or post-structural social theory that's developed over the last 30 years that speaks to questions of social uh, inequality and injustice using kind of highfalutin jargon, Wiley argues that most activists, people actually doing the work of making uh, social change, have absolutely no problem fusing their politics with the tools of positivist spatial analysis. Maps and numbers wield power precisely because of the prevalence of the God trick. Uh, so for Wiley, why not use this power towards more socially just ends? As he suggests in this, this paper from uh, a decade ago, uh, this ethos is on display in a number of examples. Um, these are not examples he talks about, but are, are good kind of touchstones that I think put it on display. So the work of the Cedar Grove Institute for Sustainable Communities in North Carolina, which is used 
GIS extensively in a number of lawsuits challenging institutionalized racial inequalities around the country here, um, in a famous case documenting the failure of the city of Zanesville, Ohio, to extend water and sewer services to black residents, or in the work of the now defunct Network Center for Community Change in my hometown of Louisville, Kentucky, which used analog pen and paper data collection to challenge the city government's uh, official measurements of vacant and abandoned properties, or even in the variety of web-based mapping tools like the EPA's EJ screen or HUD's now deprecated uh, fair housing assessment tool that are meant to make basic spatial data analysis capabilities more accessible to non-experts. In short, these kinds of projects do critique by using spatial data to prove that inequality does indeed exist and to make the case that we need to do something about it, especially through official channels like the legal system, which we talked about just a little bit in the last uh, panel. But it's precisely this brand of critical mapping that's most directly challenged by the current post-truth moment. It's increasingly evident that trying to present just the facts isn't going to convince neoliberal ideologues in city halls around the country any more than it's going to convince the fascists in the White House. But as Gunnar Olson uh, wrote in his 2010 book, the strength of cartographical reason lies less in its ability to tell the truth and more in its power to convince. And part of that power to convince lies in shifting the frame through which we understand the world. And it's precisely uh, this question that work in the second camp strives to address, albeit maybe to the simultaneous exclusion of uh, some of the concerns raised in the spirit of strategic positivism. So rather than presenting that objective 30,000 foot view of what the reality of things actually is, uh, this approach seeks to challenge some of that detach detachedness, uh, as Donna Haraway writes, by arguing for politics and epistemologies of location positionality and situating where partiality and, and not universality is the condition of being heard to make rational knowledge claims, advancing a view from the body versus the view from above or from nowhere. For Haraway, emphasizing the situatedness and particularity of knowledge, the possibility that there are other ways of knowing, doesn't make such knowledge any less useful or rational. Instead, by being situated in precisely these more subjective contexts, we can instead produce knowledge that's not only more objective in some sense, but that also provides a basis on which we can rethink the categories and methods of knowledge production altogether. So the utility of such a partial situated perspective is that it can be at once disorienting and illuminating. Um, as much of the more artistic, abstract, but also kind of embodied and whimsical uh, representations inspired by this thinking to do, uh, tends to do. So uh, work like uh, the geographer Dennis Wood's narrative atlas of the Boylan Heights neighborhood in Raleigh, North Carolina, or the work of artists like Lizzie Mogul, Ginny O'Dell, and Clement Valla, who, rather than using the scienticity of the map to make arguments about the existence of inequality, use these reworked maps to question the epistemological position of the map in the first place, to provide alternative, non-Cartesian ways of looking at and conceptualizing the world, to shift the conditions of possibility for how we actually know and represent the world through maps. So while using Haraway and Wiley as my kind of touchstones here might be a little bit problematic for those of you that have read any of these things deeply, there's a lot of overlap here. They're maybe not quite the opposites that I'm setting them up to be. Um, my argument is ultimately that these two kind of positions give way to very different ways of actually practicing critical mapping. And it's precisely through trying to bring these two lines of work together that we might develop a more effective pr cr praxis of critical mapping that I tentatively call situated mapping. Um, real novel, I know. Uh, the basic idea of this approach is that we don't have to choose between the twin imperatives of destabilizing our understanding of the objectivity of cartographic knowledge and taking advantage of such a pervasive understanding in order to produce more just social and spatial outcomes. It's possible to simultaneously use maps to prove that inequality in exists and that space does indeed matter to, uh, to the manifestation of these inequalities, while also demonstrating that the ways we usually think and talk about these inequalities uh, isn't really sufficient to understand what's actually going on on the ground. The goal and of course the challenge of doing uh, critical mapping is in this way is to not just use maps to prove a point, but also use maps uh, and mapping as a way of producing new ways of thinking about social and spatial inequalities and indeed about space and society more generally. So it isn't enough to just plot some points on a map or shade a core pleth to demonstrate the spatial clustering of some particular social ill. Our maps need not only 
to demonstrate the world as it actually is, but to counter prevailing narratives of injustice uh, and provide us with the means to think about and act differently on them. So while there isn't uh, a single way of doing this thing I'm calling situated mapping, and indeed I think some of the other folks in the room are practicing it themselves in their own way, an example from my own work might be instructive in highlighting what exactly it is I'm getting at here. So for instance, when it comes to something like understanding the spatial uh, contours of racial and class segregation in the American city, it isn't enough to just map the presence of something like racially or ethnically concentrated poverty, this federally defined indicator of census tracts that are both majority non-white and have uh, poverty rates greater than 40%. As you can see here in the case of Lexington, Kentucky, a uh, place that I spent most of my adult life. But neither does adding some qualifications and some gradations on this indicator, such as incorporating maybe a locally specific measure of median household income, do a much better job, even if it can show that maybe racially concentrated poverty is a little bit more widespread than we previously thought it to be. Even if we take inspiration from folks like Ed Getz or Douglas Massey and try to flip this indicator on its head and focus not just on those places where poor people of color live, but also where affluent white enclaves exist, we still aren't getting the whole picture. We still don't, for instance, understand how these processes have evolved over time. But again, even understanding these historical trajectories have shortcomings. Um, while knowing that the city is increasingly characterized by this kind of bifurcation and segregation is helpful, uh, this doesn't give us a complete understanding of how these processes actually work, how these things came to be, and how we might go about addressing them. So the challenge in a case like this is to draw from the late geographer Jim Blout to show how the ghetto underwrites the suburbs. How these neighborhoods of concentrated poverty and affluence, largely situated within totally separate parts of the city and very much distinct in their demographic composition, are fundamentally connected and co-produced. So one answer, I think, in this particular case is to visualize the geographies of property ownership as this map, map attempts to do by connecting the location of residential properties and areas of concentrated poverty to the locations of these owners, these properties owners outside of these neighborhoods. So even though this map is somewhat simplistic in terms of geometry, just a bunch of straight lines connecting two points, um, it provides both a visual and a metaphorical link uh, between places that are otherwise thought to be separate and apart from one another. So while difficult to visualize in a non-Cartesian way, a kind of classic problem of GIS, this map shows that conditions that we usually only visualize at the census tract scale are in fact produced through flows and relationships between nodes within each of these uh, areas. So at once we can both take up the mantle of early critiques of GIS regarding its inability to conceptualize alternative non-Cartesian spatial ontologies, while also showing the reality of how these places are actually produced in relation to one another, or, or not just produced in relation to one another, but largely maybe because of one another. So from the 506 properties seen here that are owned in Lexington's areas of racially concentrated affluence to the 1,606 owned elsewhere around the city, 542 owned elsewhere around the Commonwealth of Kentucky, another 234 scattered across the USA, and even five owned outside the United States altogether, over 40% of the residential property, not, uh, which is actually a, a lowball estimate relative to the number of residential units, over 40% of all residential property in Lexington's areas of racially concentrated poverty are owned outside of these neighborhoods, representing a channel through which the already limited financial resources of residents in these places go to subsidize other places around the city or even beyond its borders. Ultimately, these outward flows of money not only help to reproduce poverty in these neighborhoods, but also to subsidize the creation of wealthy enclaves and other places that end up being insulated from the lived experience of poverty, even though they're fundamentally imbricated in its production. So this example is part of uh, just kind of a larger paper about, about this issue that was published in Urban Geography last year that you can refer to for more detail. But I'll just wrap up this example by saying that I think what's particularly useful and, and maybe powerful, um, you can uh, question me on that, um, is that it helps us to shift our focus from exclusively being on the places where different kinds of social problems are experienced to instead looking at the, the people and places that are responsible for producing those social problems in the first place. And so ultimately, I just want to come back around and close on this point that I think the data can have a really meaningful role to play uh, here if we treat it not as um, some proof of an externally uh, produced reality, but rather as a vehicle for reimagining social and spatial processes. Again, I don't think it's enough to make maps that demonstrate that yes, inequality does indeed exist, uh, 
We need to visualize why it exists, how it's reproduced, and who benefits from it. Our maps and data visualizations need to stimulate alternative imaginations of these issues that can in turn beget alternative ways of intervening in them, targeting the root causes of such inequality rather than just its superficial manifestations alone. Thank you. Next up is Justin Hollander, who's a professor of urban environmental policy and planning at Tufts University. He works on land use and environmental planning at the local, regional, and federal levels. He directs the Urban Attitudes Lab, uh, which studies big data and the psychological dimensions of urban planning and public policy practice. Um, and some of the projects that it's taken on include social listening, as well as uh, using data gathered from Twitter to assess public sentiment in urban space. He's the author of seven books, but two recently, Urban Social Listening, Potential and Pitfalls for Using Microblogging Data and Studying Cities, and Ordinary City Planning for Growth and Decline in New Bedford, Massachusetts. He also has a podcast called Cognitive Urbanism with recent episodes such as Hip Hop Saves the City and The Urban Wonders of Montreal. Uh, Justin. Thank you, Mark, and thank you, Leah and uh, Lila, for um, organizing this. It's a real, real pleasure to be here. Um, what I um, wanted to do today is, uh, is it the green button, this one right there? Um, is talk about my experience as an urban planning researcher. I have um, worked as a planner for uh, about 10 years before getting into academia, and when we did community engagement back then, this is really all it looked like. Um, so digital urbanism back then meant you asked for people's email addresses at the end of the meeting. <laughs> um, so, you know, we've come a, a long way. Um, I uh, was part of this, this project that we called it Open Neighborhood, so 3D, immersive, right? And, and, and this morning you heard uh, about some other, other ways, um, particularly uh, the example in Oakland and the, the, the bus project, so, so the bike, lane, bike lanes project. So there's, there's lots of ways that we um, can use uh, digital technologies to, to engage people. And so in my presentation, what I want to do is, is talk about this kind of broader idea of com digital community engagement. And um, so I have a few slides uh, to, to kind of give you some of my thoughts about that. Um, and then the rest of my presentation is uh, something that I've been really excited about for a long time, um, which, which is really just these unobtrusive insights that, that we can get from data. So not requiring people to come to a room and then um, ask them their questions, but more of the kind of stuff that, that Jennifer's doing um, uh, um, and people just like collecting, collecting data from um, our life. And, and so just to kind of frame a little bit larger, what is this all about for me? Um, as someone who worked as a planner, I, I'm really passionate. I devote my work at Tufts to be able to develop tools that planners and designers can use to be more effective in their practice. Um, so when you kind of hear me go through this, it's really all t towards that aim. And, um, and so hopefully this will be some stuff that, that you might even find useful in your own work. So yeah, so digital community engagement, it, you know, it can involve, um, you know, those kinds of 3D immersive environments, it can involve websites, it can be at that, um, that interface between um, a community meeting and people using laptops, I mean, so, so all kinds of ways that we can do this. Um, but the problem is once you start moving things online, there, there are some severe dangers and, and, that, the, and that these kinds of processes can be co-opted. So, you know, obviously everyone knows about it, what happened in the, the 2016 election, um, but there have been untold number of, of stories since then. Um, just uh, last week, we, we, the big news broke about uh, this massive effort, the Chinese government deploying bots to manipulate um, j just all kinds of political discourse. Um, and so what I'm interested in is as, as we're sending urban planners out there and, and designers to, to, to engage with communities and find out what do they care about, what are, what's important to them, to what extent are those processes being co-opted as well. And, and, um, and so I've actually been doing some research in this area. Um, I don't know how many of you follow Urbanist Uma. This is a good chance right now. You can pull out your phones. You can follow her. Um, and um, the only problem is she's not human. Um, she is AI. <laughs> um, so, so here's what she can do. She can uh, like and retweet with comments. 
right there, it's like, nice work, right? I mean, pretty easy stuff. <laughs> um, she can post images that she scraped from Reddit. She uses, Microsoft has a computer vision program, um, which is basically free. Um, so she looks at it and the computer vision um, explains what is on the image. And then we have like a prefix and a suffix before that comment to make it seem human. Um, and now this is just something fairly recently, this GPT-2 language model is now um, open, open source and so she can just write extemporaneous comments. Um, she looks at Reddit forums and then um, we give her a prompt um, so I'll give you a chance to read some of these. I won't read them out loud. I told one of my students that I was coming here and he's like, well, maybe we could upgrade the model. It's much better now. Yeah, so it's a, <laughs> it's a, definitely we're not there yet with the free model, but the point is that um, people who have the means can really develop um, quite sophisticated human-like um, uh, bots, and, and then of course they can just troll. They can hire um, people, uh, slave, wage lab la slave labor wages, and, and just work in, in these uh, troll farms and, and disrupt our uh, community engagement. So, so like we've went, gone so far from that um, uh, community meeting where there's essentially no internet, now, now we're so much more vulnerable. And, um, and so the whole community engagement process is vulnerable. Um, so one of the things I'm doing right now with the funding from Land Economics Foundation is, is trying to catalog that, just to get a, a much better idea to, to what extent these kinds of bots are out there um, and, and how much is our uh, community engagement process kind of at risk um, as, as so many. I mean, I can't imagine uh, there's a, a city or town in America that, that doesn't do some, some sort of online community engagement. And so, so that's something I'm hoping to have some more results on. Um, so yeah, I just want to now just uh, shift gears and really talk um, more about the kind of unobtrusive data, this, um, these, these measures of what people care about, um, but that we're not actually asking them. Um, so I don't know if anyone's ever done like a focus group or interview research. Um, these are obviously well-known, tried and true methods of social science. But they're flawed, and there's all kinds of biases. I actually teach qualitative research methods, and we spend more time on the problems with qualitative research than how to do it. Um, and so it's, it's not that I, I want to suggest that it shouldn't be done, and, and, and I will continue myself to use obtrusive methods. And planners and designers, you should do that. You should continue to talk to people. But there are other ways, and so that's what the unobtrusive measure, measures um, suggest, these digital crumbs. Um, and so I wrote this book, Urban Social Listening, um, three years ago to, to try to just show to, to practitioners, you know, what are some really easy ways, basically free ways for you to, to, to capture what's going on in, in, um, in people's lives so that you can do a better job of, of planning for them. And, um, one of the things that uh, I started with was measuring sentiment, which, um, you know, it's just very straightforward. You know, you're, you're, you're just trying to understand kind of what do people care about, what's, what's in their life, what's, what's meaningful. Um, and I've used Twitter. I've also used a couple other apps, but Twitter is, uh, makes its API available for free. So that's really nice. Um, where most, most of the social media, you can't get it. Um, so the process that I write about and I've used in my research, um, you know, really starts with you just delineated geography. On the Twitter API, they just want the northeast and the southwest corner lat long. So not very uh, advanced there. Um, you have to just uh, enter some key information um, the, to get onto the Twitter API. There's some, uh, acts, there's some tokens and some keys. Not that hard either. A few steps. And then shazam, you, you start downloading the data. Um, and so, you know, you're getting, you're getting uh, every tweet has a unique ID. Um, you get the different screen name, user ID, um, and then the text, date, time, and latitude, longitude, of course. <laughs> well, <laughs> if you don't have latitude, longitude, what's the point? But no, we, we get it, and we know exactly where you are when you're doing each of these tweets. And, um, you know, we're not getting the full, with the, the API, they're not giving the full, population of all tweets. It's a sample, but um, very powerful. So with the sentiment analysis, you can uh, do this in many ways, but what we've done is just use a really straightforward sentiment dictionary. So this one has 3,000 words. 
where the, all these words are pre-coded on a valence from negative five to positive five. And then you just add it up. And I did this project with the New York City Department of Design and Construction. We were looking at um, a bunch of uh, cultural institutions and um, with, throughout New York City. And um, we just looked at the tweets. We gave a score based on the sentiment and then percent positive, percent negative. And um, you know, what's really amazing is that we were able to correlate these, this Twitter data with health data that the city collects at, um, I guess, the community board level. Um, but you know, with, with any of this stuff, you really need to triangulate. You, know, you can't just pick this up, run the numbers, and say, these people are happier than these people, end of story. Um, but it's part of getting insight into kind of what's going on. Um, also with DDC, we, we um, collected the, uh, uh, tweets around um, museums and tried to see, well, what, are people talking about the museum experience? Do they like it? Do they not like it? And actually, I wrote a paper about that. So if anyone's interested, just let me know. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's a really nice compliment to, in addition, in that study with DDC, we also did ethnographic research. And, and so there's a real uh, powerful opportunity to, to, to get voices that you might not hear um, if, if, all, if all you're doing is the ethnography. Um, just another quick example, just to show you what that list looks like. Uh, this is using fl uh, Flickr. Um, uh, raise your hand if you've ever used Flickr before. Oh, it's a nice, nice Flickr group here. Um, I spoke recently and nobody had ever heard of Flickr before. <laughs> it's like, it depends on where you are. Um, well, so, you know, what you're doing with Flickr is you're um, taking a picture of something that you care about. That, there's something about that place that, 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 that you're pointing your camera at that, that's meaningful. And so I was doing this project uh, with the 1772 Foundation, and they care about historic preservation. And well, we were saying, let's try to use this kind of urban social listening approach to see what places people care about. Um, so, so using both Flickr and Twitter. Um, and then we also did a community engagement process where we brought people into a room, we showed them some maps, and, um, and it's a you know, really exciting way to, to add to the, um, the conversation about what, you know, what people care about, just based on what, what kind of pictures they're taking and, and what, what they're posting. Um, this, this is a project I'm doing right now. Um, I'm having a lot of fun with it because um, Google Street View also makes their API available. Has anyone done anything with this? Raise your hand. Oh yeah, a few. So this is um, uh, again, uh, you know, all nominal cost to download um, and store, and we did this uh, with a grant from the government of Quebec. So here, what we're doing is using the a data set that uh, some other folks developed, where they asked actual human beings. Um, they asked them uh, which which place looks safer, and these are uh, two photographs in Boston, and based on that data set, we use machine learning to program the computer to be able to recognize an image, a street view image, as whether it uh, would be perceived as a, by a person as being safe or unsafe. Um, so then we collect the, the, this new data from, from uh, we did it from Montreal and Toronto, and ran it through the model. And um, our model was pretty good, about 87% accurate. So we felt good and we moved ahead and these are the, these are the places that our, our computer uh, was able to, you know, decided that was unsafe. Seems good to me, <laughs> seems pretty unsafe. And these are the ones that got a safe score. And this is just binary, that's, all, that's how we set it up. Um, you'll note a lot more greenery, so uh, the computer is very sensitive to greenery, but frankly so are we. Uh, that's, uh, that's actually a, a, a something that has been widely established in the psychological literature that, that when we see green, it's this idea of biophilia, love of nature, it's, um, we are put at ease and we are more comfortable. Um, so this is what it looks like. I, um, what I'm showing you here are the um, Google Street View images. Now we collected 30,000. We, we weren't able to get every single one, so we did it in these concentric rings around the center of the city. And so what you're seeing here is if the image was classified by the computer as being uh, unsafe, it, it has, has a, the black uh, um, plus sign, and then safe was yellow. So those of you who are geographers, Travis, um, we start to see some, you know, some patterns. We also looked at transportation policies in the city, and we uh, tried to assess where the biggest investment of transportation, this is a content analysis 
of policies that the city was um, implementing um, and then map the density of those policies. So what here you're seeing now in the background is for the polygons for census tracts in the city, the darkest blue are the ones where the, there's the most planning emphasis on transportation. And we haven't actually run the, any spatial statistics yet, but, but you do, you could kind of eyeballing it see that there are, there do appear to be some, um, some correlations between where the darkest blue is and where the black is. So, so that's telling us that places that people perceive as being unsafe are places where the planning infrastructure is in place to, to make investments and improvements. So that's it for my presentation. I look forward to the conversation later. Final speaker for the session is Laura Bliss, who is City Lab's West Coast Bureau Chief. Um, she's a journalist who covers housing, transportation, climate change, and digital technologies, often with a focus on California. She is a self-confessed map geek, and she accuses all of us of the same. And she often writes through the lens of cartography by researching how maps, both historical and digital, shape the urban environment. Laura. Thank you, Mark, and thank you again to Leah, Lila, Lucia, um, and all of the organizers for today. It's really, really a cool honor to get to be part of this. Um, so yes, uh, that was a good introduction. Um, I'm West Coast Bureau Chief at City Lab. We are a publication that covers urban policy and politics. Um, we're part of the Atlantic Magazine, so we have uh, the same kind of national focus. Um, and really, 80% of what I do has very little to do with maps. Um, it's housing, transportation, although these things ultimately do become linked um, often, but uh, you know, sort of bread and butter urban policy issues, um, but I've also really had the pleasure of, of kind of building a little micro beat um, and something of a, a digital community, I would say, um, I hope, um, around some of the topics that have um, been discussed today. Uh, green button. Oh, shoot, we didn't get the new slides up, darn. Um, okay, that's okay. Um, I will go back to the previous slide. Um, so I was hoping to show a slide of um, the map that um, really kind of started triggering my interest um, in these topics uh, maybe four or five years ago. So I'm definitely a, a newcomer to this world. Um, but it's uh, the whole house maps and papers. Um, and there may be many people in this room who are familiar with that project. Um, uh, that was a set of maps created by um, the settlement house workers of Hull House in 19th century Chicago. These were largely a group of women who were kind of pioneering um, social work and also social science at a time of um, expanding um, urbanization and industrialization and rapidly growing inequality. Um, in this country at that at that time, um, and they were doing kind of you know extending. Um, English la language education and child care services and, and kind of um, trying to work in a, in a heavily immigrant and, and um, poor neighborhood to extend, you know, sort of new services and also conducting research of their own. Um, so they uh, went around and gathered nationality, um, wage, and um, language spoken uh, data sets for this um, kind of immigrant uh, heavy neighborhood that they were working in and um, and they mapped it. It was really one of the first examples of urban data mapping in the United States, um, if not the first, um, 1895, I think. Um, and it's really a quite beautiful object and I'm sorry I can't show it to you because <laughs> I don't have it in my old slides. Um, no, it's okay. Um, but you should also go, go look it up. Um, and it really triggered my interest, I think initially, because it was colorful and pretty. Um, and two, it was like created by a bunch of untrained women, which like fascinated me at the time and, you know, add that to like the pile of stories about um, advances in, you know, science or academia that are like out, written out of history because they're women. But then over time, it's really in, increasingly continued to, to fascinate me because of these two themes, <laughs> the story as a point, um, that have continued to come up again and again in, in my work around this topic um, of mapping. And one is representation, 
Um, so, you know, putting uh, the sort of existence uh, and, and, you know, some uh, sort of data face, um, right, on, on the realities of living in this neighborhood, uh, you know, where people were not making very much money and living in, in pretty crowded conditions and, and pretty squalid conditions in some cases. Um, and also, for lack of a better term, surveillance, um, which might sound like a stretch for a 19th century map, but maybe overmapping is, is like a better term for it, and this kind of relates to Taylor's presentation to some extent, right? Because when I started learning more about the legacy of these maps, um, so one of the earliest examples of, of urban data mapping, let's see. Yeah, there it is. Yay, thank you. Awesome support staff. Um, uh, learning about the legacy and reading some of the scholarship around this, um, you know, these these maps really kind of helped, were made with good intentions, right? Like these women wanted to help like advocate for these neighborhoods that they thought needed help. Um, and like, you know, they showed these maps to the policymakers at the time and they did actually succeed in getting some change um, affected. But they weren't super great like consultants. <laughs> they didn't do a lot of um, you know, community engagement, let's say, um, around, around the map making process. Um, and, and in any case, I mean, when you look at kind of the visual like language that was starting to develop, you know, around the time that this map was made, and you look at you know the zoning and re later like redlining maps um, made by the city of Chicago and other kind of um, you know government affiliated entities, um, you see that like there's this becomes a statistical language like for poverty and places that are like less than in some way, and so ultimately this very neighborhood ended up being raised in the 1960s to make way for the University um, of Illinois. Um, so this, you know, tension between representation and over mapping or surveillance, I think later is, is something that has been a kind of constant theme in some of my work as a journalist and as a writer. Um, skip these. So I'll just kind of talk about some of the things um, I've just reported on. Um, so really kind of covering um, you know, the industry of, of digital map making and, and GIS, um, you know, sometimes more <laughs> philosophically, um, others sort of analyzing, you know, new, new changes on Google Maps. Um, this is more recent reporting looking at um, the city of Los Angeles's efforts to, um, they're, they're happening now, they're um, gathering, you know, real-time location data of people taking scooter trips um, and these sort of larger idea behind that is um, one that's gained a lot of popularity among really all the big map making companies here, Microsoft, Google certainly, um, of making, it's like this Borgesian idea of like the one-to-one -one map of reality, right? But in this case, um, it's real time and like you see everything that's happening. And, and in this case, like these policymakers and, and city officials like could help manage traffic, but it's also like, wow. Um, so anyways, that's from July, and I'm, I'm continuing to report on this. Um, and if anyone else is following this story in this room, I'm like desperate to talk to people who are not like intimately associated, because um, I'm still reporting. Um, and I also wanted to mention, too, I've, I've touched on um, WeWork, um, certainly on Sidewalk Labs, and, and um, I think I've written about Numina a little bit, so definitely have, have touched on some of the, the work that's been presented on this room. Um, two years ago, um, we launched Map Lab, which um, kind of came out of a recognition of the sort of being an interest in maps. I mean, again, people like to look at them um, on the internet, uh, but also, you know, interest in, in just this growing world that we've all been talking about of this explosion in, in kind of, um, you know, location data collection um, efforts and sensors and, and cities and text influence and so forth and, and um, in a location focused way. And so Map Lab is sort of my baby. It's every two weeks. Um, it, it generally has um, kind of a newsy, I'm gonna skip ahead. Well, yeah, and sometimes, sometimes newsy is Game of Thrones. Sometimes there's like the, the biggest headline in the country is like totally about a map. Um, in this case, uh, the infamous um, Alabama map. Um, so yeah, so sometimes, you know, it's the, every, every issue, almost every issue has kind of a newsy, like top line little mini feature and kind of wrestles with the mappy or sort of location data issues coming into play. Um, other times it's, it's like a little more fun. This is like a, you know, Game of Thrones, like end of the series, like fan map project. 
Um, and again, you know, I think between some of what I'm writing about in the newsletter, it follows along these, this sort of tension, right, between representation. It's like one of my favorite um, kind of like, you know, map projects that we've just like written about, and it's called Queering the Map, and it's a project, I think, out of Quebec. Um, this is, I think, of, in Montreal, um, but it's mapping um, crowdsourced uh, stories of, of like coming out um, or other kind of experiences related to queer identity around the world, and it's a really cool project that I had never seen anything like. Um, and then again, uh, to surveillance, right, or this idea of overmapping or, and, and the kind of questions around that. Um, and, and really what I want to say about the, um, the newsletter is, I mean, other than becoming, you know, another, like, place to put all these ideas and sort of stories happening out, you know, in my work and others' work, um, it's also, it, it's become, a, I think, a pretty cool community. So I've got about 30,000 subscribers, and they're all around the world, and, and they are very interested in maps. <laughs> um, you know, it really ranges from, like, you know, retired, like, geography professors um, to, you know, folks working in the same kind of fields that some of you have been presenting on to urban planners and... Um, and again, it's probably a bit of confirmation bias, but like I do get probably the most feedback about sort of surveillance related stories, which maybe makes sense. It's a very hot button issue, um, but also that sort of representation um, issue. Uh, what else do I have us? Oh yeah, so um, I don't know how I am doing on time, but uh, out of Map Lab has come more recently a series um, that we launched this summer called The Maps That Make Us, and this is a series of more personal essays um, exploring um, the power of maps to shape uh, public and private life. I have so many Ps, I'll be aware of that. Um, and it's been a really lovely series. Uh, we've had a lot of um, great contributors. Uh, you know, one woman recently writing about um, finding her, her mom's old London tube map, you know, after she passed away and, and kind of connecting um, to her through that object. Um, I'm going to come back to that. Uh, another one that I really love was this writer um, who who lives in Iowa and and like passed through this town called Atlas in this like crazy like <laughs> galaxy brain way. Um, and and the experience of living in a place that like Google Maps like slowly over time just sort of dropped off the map. Like you can't search for this place because it's so underpopulated. And um, and then I think my, probably one of my favorites. Oh no, this is an, it's animation. Um, you should. Oh, this is a reason to go look at this series. But this was a, from a friend of mine and an animator and writer, um, Nicole and Tebby, who grew up in El Paso, um, along the U.S.-Mexico border, of course. And the the border there is the river, right? The Rio Grande, Rio Bravo. And so, she wrote about sort of her journey as an artist and kind of thinker to find a map that like really did justice to this fluid border and could not. Um, and so she actually animated her own. I wish I could play, if that's okay. Um, so where to? Um, I think if there's one thing I've observed through um, you know, my reporting and um, kind of stoking of this little mapping community of, of readers and sort of interested people, um, it, clearly like this, this tension between representation and, and surveillance um, is constant and, and very much, I don't know, in, in this kind of opposed relationship and it seems to matter very much, you know, who is doing the mapping um, as a kind of resolution to that, like, tension if there is one. Um, and beyond that, where to, I don't know, um, <laughs> just more reporting, I guess. As I mentioned, I, I am really very focused on um, LA's kind of scooter data mapping, really data gathering efforts right now, um, among many other projects that have nothing to do with maps. Um, but more broadly, as a kind of a call out to you, I'm, I'm always interested in learning about uh, your work and your research, um, and I definitely invite you uh, to follow me on Twitter and to check out our work on City Lab. So thank you. I want to start with you. Um, and it seems like that you are thinking through and, and formulating and, um, and trying to address in your own work something that maybe is an unresolvable paradox, which is that if we no longer trust data and its mobilization, and for good reason, um, on one hand, yet on the other, data speaks, especially through maps, with all too much authority 
and claims to factual objectivity. Um, and so it seems like it's almost impossible to know where to operate within that space because on one hand we are either naive or we are cynical, and which is to say that we don't trust anything. And so part of the problem then is like how to, not only how do you produce a system of representation that somehow speaks critically back to the, um, the history of mapping and its failures and its overclaims and its simplifications, but how do you produce a system of representation that somehow manages to swerve between both the, the failure and the overstatement of data authority? I, I mean, I think the, the, what you said, the unresolvable paradox is kind of the, the long and short of the answer in a way, but I think there's both a, a kind of technical element to approaching these challenges and then a, Certainly, uh, well, there's a, a epistemological element, but then there's also just kind of a social element and how we, uh, once we make a map, once we do data analysis, once we create a product of whatever kind, right, on the one hand, we often just kind of like let things out into the world and see what happens and, you know, kind of ab absolve ourselves of what happens with, uh, with those products and stuff. But, um, so each of those has to be grappled with, right? Like on the technical side, GIS has very significant limitations in terms of representing alternative ways of thinking about the world. There's been some really cool work um, done on this. Uh, Nick Lally and Luke Bergman, who are both geographers at Kentucky and UBC, have done this thing called enfolding, where it's like you can basically, you know, whatever, digitally fold the map back together in order to create the kind of linkages between places that I was trying to show with just my, you know, two-dimensional straight lines. Um, but then epistemologically, this is where the Haraway, et cetera, comes in. But then socially, how do we make maps that um, actually, even if they don't necessarily come from the community, even if they're not necessary, necessarily participatory maps, how do they represent the the kind of experiences and values and the political positions of people that um, are in marginalized positions and how do we use them to kind of further those goals and stuff. But unresolvable paradox is probably <laughs> really the, um, it's, it's something you grapple with even if it is un unresolvable, I think is maybe the, the thing I would say. All right, oh, may, maybe we can come back to that <laughs> paradox in a second. But, um, you know, maybe this is following a similar line of thinking in, in your project Justin, it's um, at least for somebody who knows very little about these procedures of community engagement, it seemed like the way you framed the history and its evolution over the last decade was quite surprising in the sense that only 10 years ago, community engagement looked like speaking to people, and now it seems to be um, listening. Uh, and listening, uh, what did you, is it un unobtrusive engagement. And so, I'm, you know, part of me is wondering um, how, what this shift has allowed in terms of your own work, but also in a more broadly disciplinary discursive sense. Like what, what to put it differently, is, is new forms of, uh, are new forms of community engagement new forms of community engagement? I guess that would be the first question. Like, what, how, do we, uh, how do we analyze and assess what engagement looks like in these contexts? And so how does, how does technology um, uh, reconstructed notions of engagement and, um, and what are the potential benefits of that? The, because the other term that came up in your talk that I found really helpful and pivotal was the way you described the vulnerability of different communities to forms of, I don't know, postures and fake engagement. And so it seems like engagement is a term that not only has evolved, but that has evolved in relationship to new technologies and evolved in a way that makes even the basis of engagement vulnerable to mistrust and abuse. And, and so in some ways it follows up on what I just asked Justin, is how do we understand engagement then as being some kind of productive form of, of um, of work that anybody would be willing to participate in, given its vulnerabilities. 
Yeah, well, well so I think it, it connects to the kind of the title of this session, which is around representation. And, and so the, that first image I show you, I, I didn't spell it out, but the people who are represented in that, in that public meeting um, were a very narrow subset of the population. I think they were all white. The uh, average age was about 50. Um, and so what you have in, in, in any time you have a community engagement process that requires people to take time out from their schedule and travel, um, so you're, you're always going to systematically exclude some populations. And so the question is, can we come up with methods to be able to tap into that those digital crumbs that, that, in an unobtrusive way, to tap into what people care about, what's meaningful to them, you know, what, what kind of improvements they want for their community. Can we do that? Now, I'm not going to suggest that in my presentation that I've succeeded. Um, I'm hoping that, that some of my research um, it helps advance the ball, and, and maybe many of you can, can continue to advance it, because um, there, there's definitely challenges. It, it's, um, it's, not the, uh, it's not the end, it's, it's the beginning of, of trying to find, find ways to, to get more people's voices heard um, and not require them to come to the library at seven o'clock on a Wednesday. Mm. Great. Um, okay, so one of the, I mean, clearly one of the observations that one can make about today already is that um, the new technologies of data extraction and manipulation and representation are profoundly consequential for how we think about our cities and about our relationship with the cities and also about um, how we perform as um, uh, subjects in this city. And, and, and it seems like even for disciplines like planning and geography, we have difficult problems of how to use that data to construct a meaningful uh, set of representations and and how to construct those set, a set of representations like a map that might speak in response to the long history of mapping and data representation and its, um, if not its abuses, its biases, let's say. And so a complicated task within the discipline. And so how does one address a similar set of questions when your audience isn't an academic audience, isn't a technically um, uh, um, facile audience, um, but is a general readership? How do you point to the complexities of something like map representation and the way in which something like uh, bias and subjectivity is inscribed in that? Uh, because I presume that the reason that City ma uh, Map Lab exists is because these are pressing questions for our contemporary cities and these are pressing journalistic questions and not just academic or planning questions. And, and so how, how then does, let's say, the representation of systems of representation operate within journalism? <laughs> I don't have a PhD, <laughs> so I'm not sure that I can answer that question. If you answer it well, exactly. maybe they'll give you one. Uh. <laughs> uh, um, I guess I, I can answer the question to, to, in the way that I understand it, which is like, how do you how do you talk about this for a late audience, right? Um, and sort of and, and brush how to, at And how to make them aware that the reason this exists because sure, it's an important issue. Right, like, right. Yeah. yeah, I mean, other other than sort of pointing it at things and saying this is bad, you know, um, <laughs> you know, I think I, it's it's uh, the answer is the same answer that any you know reporter um, or writer really is is using as as the the tool in their toolbox. Um, which is stories, right? And and stories about real people in the world. Um, so, uh, you know, the the best example that's coming to mind. Um, you know, I, I, I'm one one example I'm thinking of is, is ProPublica. They've done um, some pretty phenomenal, um, you know, data driven, but also you know, heavy heavily reported um, investigative work around. Um, Facebook's um, algorithmic biases around um, uh, uh, 
homeowning pro uh, opportunities. I might be like butchering this because it was a, a few years ago now. Um, and just sort of taking stories of people who, you know, were not shown certain opportunities to, to buy homes in certain areas um, and others, you know, that, that did have that opportunity um, based on where they were located and other kinds of um, profile metrics. Um, another example I can think of, you know, that um, not, a, not I, but another a colleague at City Lab um, uh, wrote about a, about a year and a half ago is... Um, the efforts of um, Missing Maps, which is a kind of humanitarian map making uh, organization that um, that uh, pulls satellite data and uh, traces it onto OpenStreetMap um, as a way to um, create like physical access um, for women, in particular in parts of the world where they don't have necessarily clear um, road access to like the bathroom, right, for when they're menstruating, or you know, marked safe spaces um, when when they're feeling like they're under threat in some way. Um, and so, you know, that story was one that came with really kind of concrete examples of how um, these issues of what's on the map and what's left on the map, and and sort of who's included and who's left out. Um, actually really matter. Right. Um, so you, I don't know why I feel compelled to do this, but following Malo's model of <laughs> a question uh, for, for all of you that you, know, you might answer in your own way, you might not answer because I, I'm not even actually sure how to formulate this, but it seems that, um, that all of you and everybody here in this room who's speaking is some way trying to contend with the implications of you know, what we can call something like an observational paradigm that, observed, uh, that emerged in, in the world um, in the 60s and 70s and has accelerated since. And, and uh, everything you're describing around the particularities, uh, particularities of data and mapping seems to be um, a very contemporary subset of that paradigm. One, you know, one of the curious features of this observational paradigm is that we have no idea really what it's observing. Um, what we have is, a, you know, we have some occasional hints, we have some occasional moments of insight or communication, we have some sometimes paranoid, sometimes not paranoid, paranoid enough idea of what um, the scope and scale of global observation is and, and how we're positioned in it. Um, and, and, and so it feels like you know, this is something like the 21st century condition of you know, data subjectivity. This is, this is what has formed us, but, it, but it's formed through a kind of paranoid imaginary. Um, uh, and again, maybe not paranoid enough. But so how, how does one pose and how do you think about your counter projects? Because each in your own way, a kind of public literacy project, uh, uh, an engagement project, a counter mapping project, each of these are projects that speak back, not just to the particular objects that you study, but to the, this observational paradigm, speaks back to the complex structuring of our political, social, financial, cultural world through data collision and, and manipulation. How, does, how do you even begin to speak to that dimension of obser the observational paradigm that, that we work in? And, and so how does a counter project get us to there and not just within the particularities of our own representational systems. And maybe that's impossible. Like maybe that just, you know, maybe that's what we're here to do or maybe you each have thoughts on how you how you approach that. I, I can respond to this one if you yeah. uh, or start at least um, I mean one of the things from the kind of work that I do, I mean calling it counter mapping, I think it's probably fair. But that part of that is that almost all of the projects that I've worked on, whether it's that, whether it's work that I've done with social media data um, that tries to kind of develop a similar analysis ultimately of the connections between different kinds of places that we usually think of as being separate, but is that it always actually starts with some other kind of data representation, right? It always starts with a particular slice, a particular look at one set of ostensibly authoritative data and says, well, maybe this isn't actually the story we should be drawing from, from this ostensibly authoritative uh, representation. How can we either look at the same data quite differently? Um, how are the possibilities 
embedded within each individual data set not really being realized because either they're too technically difficult, the kind of blind spots of, um, of our analytical procedures or even just our ideologies, what we even measure. So how can we in introduce other kinds of data into the, the equation to think about the same very issue differently, right? I mean, in the, the case of the stuff in uh, Lexington, right, I start with the racially concentrated area of poverty. If we, you know, rewind ourselves back to uh, the Obama presidency when um, HUD was even mildly functioning, right, and affirmatively furthering fair housing, the imperative of affirmatively furthering fair housing was to reduce the total number of census tracts qualified as racially or ethnically concentrated areas of poverty. How you did that was kind of a, like, eh, like it's up to you kind of situation, right? And so the way that that's measured and mapped and managed is a very short-sighted thing that doesn't kind of appreciate that projects like Hope 6 and the way that Hope 6 uh, has been used to eliminate racially concentrated areas of poverty, but just by displacing those folks to other areas and creating new areas of racially concentrated poverty elsewhere, um, right? So that's the kind of dynamic that the map ultimately or, or that's where that comes from. Um, obviously, didn't get into all of that in the right. talk, but right, it, it always starts from something, uh, some existing representation, really, and saying how can we look at it differently. Cool. Yeah, I'd like to give you a response to that. So, like I was thinking about this morning, uh, Professor Hudson introduced um, us in the that first session and mentioned uh, William Mitchell at MIT. So he's uh, was the author, late author of the uh, book City of Bits which um, I've been thinking about actually a lot lately. You know, Mitchell's vision was that architects and planners were going to shape this internet world, this digital world, this city of bits. And actually, he was wrong. <laughs> architects and planners have been uh, totally uninvolved um, in, in, in shaping this, this virtual world that, that we all inhabit on our phones and our computers. We're, we're barely involved at all. And, um, and I think it's a, it's a tragedy. Um, and, and I think that when we think about the, the, the community engagement challenges that, that I spoke about, um, that that's, that's an opportunity. You know? So it's a place for us to reassert some authority. The fact is that the internet is, is this lawless anarchy um, realm in that there's, there's very little control, there's very little regulation in the way that the real world is, is this highly regulated place. Um, you can't cross the street without um, there's some sort of regulation governing how you act. On, online, it's not true. Um, so online, you can do whatever you want, really. And, and it's, it's not OK. And, I, and actually, I wrote about this. Uh, I did an op-ed recently about um, hate speech. And I think we can do a lot more because a lot of the hate that festers online then gets translated into um, actual real violence. And so um, in terms of community engagement and planning and design, I think it's the same thing, that, that the stuff I'm doing with uh, Urbanist UMA, um, you know, that, that's about trying to understand how these bots are operating, how these nefarious actors are going about their business. If we can understand, if we can, um, as, as skilled designers and planners, we can detect what's happening, then we can shut it down and then we can create processes that are just and open and fair. Um, I'm not sure if I'm answering this question, but I, but I, I think it adds to the <laughs> overall conversation and, and maybe a follow-up to my previous comment. First, I just want to say I, I'm so interested in learning more about these bots. Um, because urbanist Twitter is already <laughs> bizarre <laughs> enough. <laughs> um, uh, but I'll just add too, um, you know, as reporters, as journalists, it is our job. I mean, you know, while City Lab, uh, you know, has certainly given a platform for voices that are critical, you know, of, of certain you know data gathering projects happening in cities. You know, our, our reporting work, you know, is is really meant to come from. Um, as fair a place as possible, right? And, and a, a, from a place of, of inquiry into, you know, why and, and sort of what is happening, um, rather than coming from a place of sort of ideology about about or, or even you know sort of ac academic framework um, for thinking about this stuff. Although I find these ideas fascinating, um, and and maybe some creep in. Um, so you know, we're we're just as interested in 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 what the people, you know, and, and the entities that are doing some of this work um, that we've explored today, um, you know, think about it and, and this, the choices that they're making, right? And, and, and why they think it's a good thing, um, in addition to, you know, the elements of their, of their work that, that are concerning or, or have a very, you know, provable 
um, bad outcomes. Um, so. Um, well, thanks for your responses to that. No, it's a, um, the specter of paranoia may be still, still <laughs> here. Do we have time for questions from the audience? What I thought fascinating was the fact that we have given, been given presentations, but there has been no downsides that we have been advised about. In other words, as in the marketplace, there should be truth in lending. And if we are presenting stuff that has implications for negative, I think we as consumers need to be advised about that. I agree. I mean, yeah, many, many instances of mapping these very same issues, I think, are counterproductive. And that's where, I mean, I can't get into all of the reasons why in the context of the presentation format and stuff, but um, I think it's certainly fair to say that many, if not maybe most, things are actually counterproductive in terms of how we use data in some of these ways. So how can we do it differently is the question I'm trying to answer. Maybe you can't, but. Uh, what would be the driving purpose and hypothesis behind this map? Well, again, as I, I explained in my instruction, this is um, a tool for planners and designers to understand what's going on in a place and using the technology that's available through the machine learning and using the data that's available through Google Street View. Um, and I would certainly not expect it to be the sole data source that a planner might use in, in making any important analysis or recommendation, but it certainly can give you some really interesting insight. Um, I have to say that I am simultaneously fascinated and horrified by the, we've moved from speaking to people to listening to people. <laughs> it's a great synthesis. Um, I mean, it assumes, first of all, that we didn't listen to people before. I mean, maybe it was imperfect, but we did listen to people. But I want to challenge the assumption embedded in that in that the way we used to do it didn't scale and that we must scale. Yeah, no, I agree. I think that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so the, the, there's no reason that we should stop listening to people, but you're right. The, the history of um, Sherry Arnstein's Ladder of Citizen Participation, and I mean, it's a, it's a dark, dark history of, of listening to people. Um, of, of ignoring them, placating them, and, um, and so if we can do a better job of understanding what they care about without pretending to listen to them, um, that seems pretty powerful in a good way. The 2020 election, I mean, the uh, census is coming up next year, and have you looked at the impacts of technology and, and gerrymandering, especially Taylor, because 2021 is when Republican states would be redistricting, especially urban areas, and there's a fear that because of the Supreme Court decision that urban areas would be losing representation. Have you looked at the weird maps that they be making? Uh, I haven't done anything, you know, kind of specifically investigating gerrymandering a number of people that know much more kind of about those particularities do, but I mean, I think it's just a, and to, take your point and, and make it just a little bit more abstract is that gerrymandering and the entire way that our electoral system is based around very particularly drawn spatial units is a, um, one way of obfuscating kind of the underlying realities of, of things, right? If you shifted state boundaries for three counties in the United States in 2016, you would have had, had a different electoral uh, outcome for the presidential race, right? Um, because of suburban areas in Chicago, Philadelphia, and, um, and what, Milwaukee maybe, or something. Um, so yeah, I, I can't speak to it anymore, but you're right that that's a kind of key issue, and, and one of the places that maps are being used incredibly nefariously, uh, and have been for quite some time now. Yeah. Yeah, we at City Lab and, and through the newsletter that I was um, featuring, um, had it in my earlier slide deck, it's definitely been one of the you know, ongoing, the, the biggest mappy news stories um, of the last couple of years. And so we've pretty closely followed, you know, each state level um, court battle and of course the recent Supreme, US Supreme Court decision um, around gerrymandering. 
um, and as well as looking into what you know the possible implications could be for the upcoming elections and into the future and kind of where the battlegrounds are now. Um, as well as you know, uh, profiles of people who've been involved at the, in those like legal fights um, and map makers coming up with potentially better, less uh, biased ways of, of drawing election maps. Um, and I would add too that we've also been covering, this is more my colleague Kristen Capps, um, covering um, the ongoing question around the census next year. Um, you talk about you know, the data that goes into um, policy, you know, policy making and, and critical federal funding decisions, um, you know, what it means that uh, there's been this ongoing question um, hovering around citizenship um, for the 2020 census. And, and even if it's not going to be on it, right, it seems like there, there could be damage that's already done in terms of people showing up and responding to those surveyors um, and what that, you know, says about population counts and, and representation in that sense, so. Yeah. So I have one comment and one question, um, and this could lead into the afternoon as well. I think maybe what was um, being raised earlier is this question of, I mean, I'm excited about machine learning and computer vision, but in that paper from MIT, they trained it on MIT students, how they read the environment of where it's safe, and you could just see the class positions of how to read the environment, right? So we want to think again about the algorithmic justice issues, I think. Um, but I guess my question is for Laura. Um, I'm, I think we're all talking about how to engage socially with maps and data maps. And I'm curious about the role of um, journalism and media. And you must think a lot about who is your readership. Um, and you know the, public disc the role that public discourse plays in how our societies and polities move. So who who reads City Lab? <laughs> and oh. which is it people like us only? Or <laughs> are we reaching other populations as well, do you think? And you said the main issues they're interested in are surveillance and representation. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit more. What are they um, interested in about yeah. those issues? Yeah. What's your data on your readership, Laura? <laughs> Um, I am not at liberty to share <laughs> extremely discreet data <laughs> on our readership, but um, for, well, first of all, I'll just address the last thing you said, so surveillance and representation. So that, that was kind of a, two themes that I was identifying in, in like my maps-related maps, maps related coverage. So our coverage is much broader than that. We write about cities and kind of urban policy and politics um, writ large. Um, for a few million readers a month, um, predominantly in the United States, and but also other many other places around the world. Um, like we're part of the Atlantic Magazine, so we ha share that sort of national focus and and um, kind of like what's the big idea here um, sort of um, slant. Um, who reads us? Uh, certainly, we have a lot of passionate urban planners and city officials and sort of policymakers working at the local level and state level and federal level, reading our work because. Um, a lot of it is about policy and the sort of out, you know outcomes and, and sort of processes of of, um, of working it out, uh, and then you know a wider sort of concentric sort of circle around outside of that of people who are just fascinated by cities and care about the places they live and might be you know working in their communities in some other way, um, and then that's like our core readership, and then you know certainly we have we have a fair amount of reach, um, and and certain stories like certainly do break out of that. Uh, kind of two first rings, so to speak, and, and, and reaches, I mean, any, anybody on the internet, you know, I mean, we've, we've had stories that, you know, touch on super wonky, like, <laughs> what, you know, were maybe previously more, like, niche urban planning, you know, issues, like, a story on, you know, why uh, the United States abandoned public transit, and this was just this, like brilliantly argued, uh, you know, piece with great visual accompaniments by a freelancer um, that had this, like, he was actually a P Columbia PhD, a historian of, of transportation that just really laid it out, and, and that really broke through to actually a much wider range of just general readers. Um, so, check us out. <laughs> <laughs> great, thank you again, and thank you all. Thank you.